So the Institute, our Institute has spent many, many years working on GMO food issues. Some of you have questions on that. I'll be happy to answer that in a moment. But now with GMO 2.0, especially the ease of gene editing, we realize we need to pivot our focus. And instead of focusing on consumer education for better choices in the supermarket, which has all this ripple effect, we need to stop governments from allowing gene edited GMOs to be released. And so we want to block the release of all genetically modified microbes. Now, at responsibletechnology.org slash take action right now, we're going to have a number of things in there. So people watching this later, go there, see what the action is of the day. But right now, the USDA happened to put out recently a draft guidance for how you could get a permit to genetically engineer microorganisms. It's a disaster. The USDA looks through blinders and defines what could go wrong in such a narrow way that they'll essentially ignore the, the flood of microbes being produced by academia and the flood of microbes that are being used in facilities as synthetic biology plants to produce things like CBD and drugs and enzymes and whatnot. They'll genetically engineer bacteria or yeast or algae to produce certain proteins, even supplements. And what if those genetically engineered microbes get out? What if the one that's producing the medicine gets out and now it becomes part of your gut bacteria producing the medicine or part of the bacteria in the soil or in the air? This will be avoided by the USDA in its narrow focus. So for those online now, we need some additional names so it's not just IRT submitting it. Please do this today. Even if you have to do it while you're listening, responsibletechnology.org slash take action. Add your name, please, to our comment, which is long. I wouldn't recommend reading the whole comment now while I'm talking because it's like several pages. There's a summary there though. And it talks about some of the things we just did that are being ignored by the USDA. And the comment period ends on May 21st, 2023. We're trying to extend it. And we have some other things that we're gonna be putting into that take action place too. So we'll let you know when there's another opportunity to let your voice be heard. So I'm gonna stop here for a moment I see three hands up if anyone else has a question. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about the microbes, about GMO 2.0, but really about anything. So Bin Wu, uh, your hand is up. I'm gonna unmute you, but you've been up for a long time. So you may have forgotten. You may have walked away. So we'll see if you're still there. Okay, Bin Wu, what is your question? Well, you may have walked away. I'm gonna mute you again. Rita, I'm gonna mute, I'm gonna unmute you. So you ready? Here you go. Thank you, I am ready. A question for you. The blueberries have made uh, to the dirty dozen list again. There are so many different brands in the market. So how do you know? Do you think that all the blueberries should, you know, cannot be sprayed with the pesticides probably or should we take the assumption that they all are and just eat only organic blueberries? Thank you, Rita. I'm, I'm muting you again. This is an excellent question. Let's start with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. This is put out by those excellent people at the um, Environmental Working Group. And what they do is they take U.S. government statistics for residues of agricultural chemicals. And they only look at fruits and vegetables. Now, the U.S. government has been manipulated, to say the least, by Monsanto. Uh, I've documented it for years. They basically, as one person who was formerly at the FDA said, 
that the regulatory agencies have done everything that big ag, Monsanto, has asked them to do or told them to do. And they told, Monsanto told FDA, oh, you don't have to test for the residues of Roundup. It's safe. You can drink it. It's safer than table salt. Don't drink it. It's a method for suicide in, in Asia. And so it's one of the residues that are not evaluated by the government. And they're not showing the impact of residues from Roundup or its chief poison glyphosate in the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. So it's a partial criteria. So if you go to responsibletechnology.org, to our homepage, you can go to and, and see a list of all the tests that we have been able to accumulate, that we've done, that Moms Across America have done, that, your, that Environmental Working Group has done, different groups. And you can see which foods have high levels of glyphosate, like oats and wheat and all the beans and legumes and all that. So the first thing you should know, Rita, is that the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen by itself is not sufficient. In addition, EWG has basically turned a blind eye to the dangers of GMOs for a long time. And they had corn and have corn and papaya on the Clean 15, even though both can be genetically engineered. Papaya only if it's from Hawaii and corn, unless it says non-GMO or organic. So it's not a perfect system. Now, as far as trying to figure out which blueberries, I'm going to recommend, Rita, that if something is on the dirty dozen, you certainly want to eat the organic version of those or the farmer's market version where you know the farmer. And I wouldn't risk it. Some of those chemicals are very nasty. In fact, I recommend eating organic across the board. There's a film that I did with Amy Hart called Secret Ingredients, where we interview individuals and families that switch to organic. Autistic kids on the spectrum are no longer on the spectrum. Infertile parents, infertile couples now have kids. There's weight problems and brain fog and skin conditions and irritability and, all, and digestive disorders and allergies. And this was in just a small group, but we have surveyed 3,256 people who reported getting better from 28 different conditions when they switched to non-GMO and largely organic. And we can show you, maybe we'll do that later today, a bunch of charts showing how the increased use of GMOs and Roundup in the U.S. food supply is paralleled with the increase of about 35 different diseases. So switching to organic is pretty critical for health, Rita. And I would do it with thinking like, well, add some of your medical budget in there. And since you'll be saving the health of the farmer and the environment, add some of your philanthropic do dollars in there. And as you'll see in the film Secret Ingredients, there's, uh, which you can rent at secretingredientsfilm.com, that many, many of these people are not going to the doctor and don't have the doctor's bills that they used to. Dramatic reductions far more reduced in doctor's bills than the increase in their food bills. So that's my answer to you, Rita. Um, uh, if, why don't you put your hand down and if you have a follow-up question, we can come back to you. Rochelle Baer, are you ready? Here you go, you're, un, you're um, unmuted, Rochelle. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey, I guess, how do I address you? That's I'm good, Jeffrey. Doctor, Jeffrey, no, okay. Don't, don't demote me to a doc, sorry, I'm just <laughs> Okay, um, my question is basically on food. Like when you go into the supermarket, I, I eat all organic, I buy organic, but sometimes I see like a tomato and it's white inside. And I wonder about it being gassed. And- You know, I, I have to stop you right there, Rochelle. I'm, I'm pretty narrow in my focus. Um, I don't, I focus on GMOs, and the chemicals sprayed on GMOs, which is like Roundup and the new GMOs. So I, I'm afraid I'm not the person to ask about gassing tomatoes. 
But so if I buy organic, do I know that it's not GMO? I can answer that. Okay. All right, I'm going to put you on mute for a second here. All right. So organics do not allow the intentional use of GMOs. They do not allow the intentional use of glyphosate-based herbicides like Roundup. I use the word intentional. Sometimes there's contamination. Sometimes it comes in ways that are unavoidable. The U.S. Geological Survey found that glyphosate was in 60 to 100 percent of the air samples they tested and the rain samples. So if you have glyphosate in the rain, you'll have low levels of glyphosate possibly in your crop because it gets absorbed through the roots, it moves to the food, we eat it. So if you go to responsibletechnology.org and you go to the glyphosate residue database, you will see some organic products will have low levels of glyphosate. The non-organic would typically have much higher levels. It depends on the particular product. Now, sometimes there's fraud. Sometimes there's accidental mixing. But I still think organic is, is a safe way to go. Now, with GMOs, if you have a field that's organic and you have a GMO field next to it, you might get some cross-contamination. There might be contamination in the seeds that you buy. And so there might be some GMOs in your organic. The non-GMO project, I love them, they require testing if your product has any potential GMOs in it. So if it has you know, corn or soy, cottonseed oil, canola oil, it will require testing. And it needs to be, uh, you know, maintaining it below an action threshold of about 0.9% of contamination. And you need to have that level of production in order to get that seal, a little butterfly. If you're organic, you don't need testing. It's a process based. It's not a testing based. So you might actually exceed the amount of of contamination that would be allowable by the non-GMO project, which is why if you see organic and non-GMO project together, that's like the gold standard, unless you're growing yourself or you know your farmer, because then you know it's not allowed to have Roundup, it's not allowed to have GMOs, and if there's any at-risk ingredients, it's been tested. Now, if you had to choose between organic and non-GMO project verified, what would you do? I recommend choosing organic because if it's non-GMO project verified, they don't test or concern themselves with Roundup or other toxic chemicals. So you can have oatmeal that's verified non-GMO. Oats are never genetically engineered, not yet, but oats are saturated with Roundup. Now, why would they spray a plant killing herbicide on oats? They do it three to five days before harvest is what is recommended to dry down the crop. It kills it slowly, but it dries it down so it doesn't mold. It's easier to harvest. It forces rapid ripening, you know, like the plants dying and says, send all the energy to the kids. So all of the extra energy goes to the grain. It forces rapid growth and ripening, and it kills the weeds for next year. So it's used by grain farmers, particularly oats and, and wheat. It's used by legumes, so the peas, the mung beans, the chickpeas, etc. It's also sprayed on the vineyard rows, and it goes in through the roots, and so it's in wine. You spray it on the ground in orchards, so it's in orange juice. Um, it's, it's pretty pervasive. So the non-GMO project doesn't test for Roundup, but organic is not allowed to use Roundup. So organic would be my first choice. If you can't get organic, at least get non-GMO and avoid those products that have high levels of residues from the list at responsibletechnology.org.